All right, we're going to get started. Good morning. Um, just so you know, this session is being recorded, so anything that gets said, if you've got your mic on, will be recorded as part of the meeting, all right, or as part of the class session. I'm not going to sit and read to you. I think you're all above that, but I did send this out just a bit ago, and this is the thing I want to concentrate on in here for just a couple minutes, all right? Now, there are 10 of you in this class, and just for your information, four of the 10 people in this class had a different class with me last fall. The reason that I'm telling you that is some of the stuff that we're going to go over today, things like Git and GitHub, et cetera, may make no sense to some of you. And to some of the rest of you, you might be like, we already know how to do this. Well, again, be cognizant of the fact that there are people in this class that this is their first class, all right? And since this is their first class, all right, since this is their first class, they're, you know, I'm going to have to go over some stuff that I went over with some of the people last semester, all right? Now, you, you might be getting messages that come up that say that people are waiting in the lobby, et cetera. If you get that, you can admit them. So just click the admit button and that'll admit them. And if for some reason it doesn't work, just let me know and I'll admit them. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do in just a couple minutes is we're going to go over the syllabus for the class. I don't want to waste a lot of time doing it, but it is important that we do that. So you have some kind of an idea as to everything that's going on. At any time when I'm lecturing, I don't ever mind having people say, hey, wait a minute, I don't understand this or whatever, or could you repeat that? Or occasionally, you know, you're going too fast or whatever. And if that's the case, please feel free to cut in and let me know. I'm not at all offended. All right, so what we're going to do today, this is the game plan. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over the syllabus. Now the syllabus has on it all nine or 80 days that the class meets. Of course, I'm not going to go over all 80 days. That would be silly to do. I'm going to go over just what we're going to do this week. So I'll go over the beginning of the syllabus and then I'll go over once we get into it, what we'll be doing this week. Once we get done with that, I'm going to show you where you can go to download the editor that you will need to write basically and to create your web pages. It's on the screen, but what I'm going to do is I've already got a copy of it. I'm going to uninstall my copy and reinstall it. So if you have any problems, you'll be able to follow along with me. Now I'm taking for granted, and if I'm wrong here, you're going to have to let me know, but that all of you at a minimum know what a browser is. So if I say to you Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge or Firefox, et cetera, you know what I'm talking about. You will need to have a browser for this class. As it says on there, I recommend that you use Google Chrome. If you say, I don't like Chrome, I like Firefox or I like something else, that's fine, all right? The examples that I go through with you will all be based on Google Chrome, but it will work fine on any browser. We are going to download three pieces of software today. All right. The first one will be Visual Studio Code, which is known as an editor, which is going to allow us to create files. All right. We're going to start doing that already today. All right. So that you'll be able to eventually create web pages. We're also going to download two other software products and all the stuff, just so you know, everything that you download in this program, not just this class, but in this program, it's all free. So you won't have to pay for anything. You, sh you shouldn't be asked for credit card information or anything like that, all right? So when we get done with Visual Studio Code, we're going to download Git and we're going to download GitHub. All right, and if those make absolutely no sense to you and you don't know what they mean, again, just bear with me. I will uninstall Git on my machine 
GitHub, it's more, it's harder to do that, but I will walk you through the steps. And again, as we're going through this stuff, if something doesn't make sense, or if you try something and it doesn't work, just break in and let me know, and we'll see if we can get it to work for you. All right. I've also mentioned before, and I'm going to say it again, that every lecture that I do, all right, will be taped. And I have my own YouTube channel, and those lectures will be put out on my YouTube channel. In fact, I've got a playlist for this class that I think I sent out already, and if I didn't, it's okay. I'll send it out today. I've already gone through and done PowerPoint lectures on both the textbooks that we have for this class. Now, for one of them, I think for the, uh, I don't know which one, but one of them may have been an older edition of the book, but it's basically the same. So I've already got about 60 videos out there if you're interested in looking at those. And again, I will send you the URL for that. All right, you will get that later today. So let's, let's go in and take a quick look at the syllabus for the class. All right, so the course, just so you know, AWD, that's the program that you're now in. That's application and website development. All right, there are four courses in the program. Okay, and the first one that people typically take is the one you're in now, AWD 1000, Web Development Technologies. The next one you will take is AWD 1100, and that's programming in C Sharp. That's what you take during the first year. Both those classes will run live from 8.05 a.m. Monday through Friday until 11.55 a.m. Monday through Friday. In the second year, you take AWD 1111, which is also called Database Driven Web Development 1, and you'll take AWD 1115, which is Database Driven Web Development 2. All right, we don't have to talk about those right now, but I just wanted you to know again, and those classes also, just so you're aware of it, they meet live in the afternoon from 12.05 p.m. till 3.55 p.m. I teach all of the classes online in the program, and that's why they meet at the times in which they meet. All right, okay. This is my information. I am literally broadcasting from my house right now, so calling that number isn't going to do you very much good. The easiest and best way to get a hold of me is via email. Now, if you get a hold of me via email and you need one-on-one -on -one coaching or help or whatever, I can set up an individual Microsoft Teams meeting with any of you at any time. I mean, not while class is going, of course, but before class, after class, in the evening, etc. I have no problem doing that. All right. OK, again, this is an online course, and typically I'm at the computer at any time after about six in the morning or so. So from six to eight, that is a good time to try to get a hold of me if you indeed want to. All right. The next thing that's in here are the program level outcomes. And I'm not gonna read a bit of this to you. Again, you can all read, but the one that is relevant to this class or the two, I should say, that are relevant to this class are the first one and the last one, all right? In this class, we will learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. There'll be a little bit more as well, but that's basically what we're, we're going to learn. In just a few minutes, you're going to, to, to learn about and be able to install both Git and GitHub. And those work together as a version control system to manage your code. Now, if you find that really confusing and you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about, that's to be expected. And don't worry about it. Again, we're gonna walk through it in just a few minutes. All right, the books for this class, <clears throat> are the ones that are shown there. Murox HTML and CSS 5th edition, Murox JavaScript and jQuery 4th edition. We will be using the first book that you see there for approximately the first 30 days. 
of the class and the second book for approximately the last 50 days, just so you have a breakdown. You really don't need the JavaScript and jQuery book, on, you know, probably until at least I would guess somewhere around the end of February. All right. Now, if you've ordered the book and don't have it for whatever reason, I contacted the publisher yesterday and got them to give me chapters one, two, and three of this book in a PDF format. All right. And I have actually put that out there under a GitHub repository. I'll show you how to get it in just a little bit. If for some reason you don't have the book and I show you how to use the GitHub repository, but you're still having problems, then just email me at jpscott at rankin.edu and I'll just send you a copy through email. All right. OK, so here is the course description. Again, I don't want to read to you. This is a class in which you are to learn how to design and develop websites. We're actually going to start doing it today. The stuff we do today will be almost incredibly simple. All right, but I try to adhere to the crawl, walk, run type of mentality. All right, I don't want to sit there and and uh, you know teach you to swim by by taking you out in a boat into the middle of a lake and pushing you in. All right, so today we're, for lack of better words, we're we're, we're basically just going into the kiddie pool and walking around. We're not doing a whole heck of a lot, but we will do more and more as we go on, as you'd expect. As far as the course level outcomes, again, you can read those. And you'll notice that when you look at them, that they all basically encompass the use of HTML. If you don't know what that means, you will by the end of the class today. CSS, same thing, and JavaScript, same thing. Now, some of the stuff we won't get to for a while in here. All right, things like this. If you read this, manipulate the DOM using JavaScript and jQuery, that's something we won't get to for quite a few weeks yet. So don't worry about that. All right, at least for right now. All right. If you have questions on different things, as it says, you can go out to the Rankin Handbook. If you don't know that, all right, I believe the easiest way to even get to that, if you ever have a question, is to go out to the Rankin website, which is rankin.edu. And once you get out there, if you go into the search bar right here and you type in, I don't know if they have the handbook. I know the catalog is out here. All right. Student handbook. There you go. So you can go out and you can find it down there. You can even download it if you're so in, you know, if you want to. All right, so let's jump back into here. Now, attendance. Attendance is different for an online course than it is for a seated course. What's going to happen in here is you are going to be given homework assignments. Now, those homework assignments, they'll always be assigned at least a week in advance. All right, and they will be due on a Sunday evening by midnight or technically 11.59.59. All right, that's how you're graded in here. So everyone is going to be graded as present this week because you won't have any homework that's due this week. Your first set of homework won't be due till a week from Sunday. I think that's like the 22nd. All right, so everyone will be marked here this week. All right, but the way that it works is let's say it's the 22nd in person X does not turn in their homework. All right, if they don't, they're marked as absent. If you have two absences, you'll get a warning. All right, you'll get a warning from basically uh, from inside Rankin. And if you miss again, you drop from the class. Now, sometimes there's extenuating circumstances. You could get COVID. You could have a, a, a sickness yourself or an illness in your family. If that happens, you have to let me know about it by emailing me and letting me know as soon as possible. And I will try at least to work with you on that. But again, when you look on online classes here, as it says, the allowable number of absences is, is two. After that, you're going to be dropped from the class, but you can't appeal it. If that happens to you and you want to appeal, all right, 
just email me and let me know because there's a, a simple form that you have to fill out. All right, and I will send you that form. And if you do that and you get the, the form sent to you and you send it back in, there's a process that you have to go to. I don't want to go through it right now, but um, you're allowed to remain in the class for that time. You're still considered part of the class. All right. Academic honesty. Well, you know, this is the probably the hardest type of thing to make sure that it happens in an online class. I don't see any of you. You don't see me. All right, but the, the idea is you're not going to cheat. Now, if it turns out that again, person X here is if, if that's you and you're having trouble in the class, so we're a couple weeks in and stuff just isn't making sense to you, then please email me. I will try to set you up with a tutor. It'll be somebody who will work with you electronically to try to answer questions that you have. There is no cost for a tutor. If you really understand this stuff and you want to be a tutor, you can work up to, I think it's 20 hours a week and you get $10 an hour. All right. I mean, 200 bucks isn't a great amount, but if you amortize that out over 16 weeks, that's 3,200 bucks you could technically make. All right. The grade scale is shown right there. Now, just so you know, this is a little bit of a misnomer for a grade scale. Rankin does not give Fs. I'm sorry, Rankin does not give Ds. If you are below 74 and a half, you fail. That's not my rule. That's a Rankin Technical College rule. You will never see a D on a transcript. It'll be either, either an A, a B plus, a B, a C plus, a C or an F. All right. Now this workload table that's here, sometimes people get a little bit confused over it. So let me try to explain what this is supposed to mean. OK, and that that is this. I, I'll have people who will email me um, between semesters and say, hey, I'm thinking of taking your AWD 1000 class next semester. Can you tell me how much work I have to do outside of class? And my answer is typically no, I can't. Because everyone is different. All right, and in just a couple of minutes, when we go when we go down and start looking at what's actually in the syllabus as far as your schedule, okay. When I set this up, there's something I should have done that I didn't do, and we'll go over it in just a minute. And that is this: every Friday will be a lab day, regardless of what it says on your syllabus. Every Friday will be a lab day. What does that mean? That means that I will not be taping during that time. I will not be taping, but I will be online. I will be online in Teams, so you'll be able to contact me if you need one-on-one -on -one help or whatever, or you can email me, all right? So some people find that if they, if they really work hard, that um, they can get most of their work done on that Friday. Other people, it takes them longer to get going or they have a harder time understanding the material and they need to spend time outside of class. We are told by our counselors here at Rankin to tell people to plan on spending almost two hours outside of class for every hour you're in class. Well, if you're in class every week for approximately, approximately, all right, four hours, OK, it's really three hours and 50 minutes, but four hours, four times five would be 20 hours. And if you double double that, it'd be 40 hours. 20 plus 40 would be 60. I, I would be very surprised if any student spends 60 hours a week on any class. But there are going to be some topics that we go over that you'll probably be able to pick up very quickly and you'll have to spend very little time on them. There'll be other topics that we go over.
Thank you. There. The idea is, again, if you need a tutor, first contact me. I will contact Mr. Glenn or whomever has to be contacted. If you've got any kind of a disability that really shouldn't affect you in this class, again, you'll have you'll have at least a week for homework assignments and you're going to basically have almost the whole day for, for tests. All right. Now, as you get into this, you may not care about this right now, but especially when you're in your third or really your fourth semester. All right, the career service department becomes important here. There is a thing online that you can sign up for under the Rankin Technical College website, and that is called the Rankin Connection. And if you if you sign up in there and you put in the your what your program is, whenever jobs become available, you'll get an email with a job. All right, but th that's not that big a thing if this is your first class. Snow days and campus emergencies. The good news with an on day with an online class is that should not be an issue. I will tell you that I have been at Rankin now for six and a half years. Last semester was the first time ever I had to take a single sick day, so I'm not typic. I don't typically miss, and that was because I had bronchitis and laryngitis, and there was no way for me to communicate to the class. All right. But you can just plan on class meeting every day. If for some reason something weird happens, I'll try to let you know as soon as I possibly can. All right. Now, if the weather were to get real bad and my internet connection would go down, which has happened, then typically what I do when my internet connection goes down is I have to change out of my comfy clothes that I'm wearing now and put on my Rankin clothes. I drive over to Rankin. All right, and I use the internet from Rankin. If that ever happens, I'll let you know. I'm literally 15 minutes from the Rankin campus, so if for some reason that happened, I'd have to stop class for a couple minutes, you know. But again, that that's that's happened once, and it was you know was wasn't even that big a thing. All right, let's see. Again, unless you are otherwise advised, assume that classes will be held. All right, so let's look at this. We're doing the class introduction right now. All right, now that student handbook review, I'm not going to go over the handbook with you, but one thing that I'm going to send out to you, I want to show you this. So one thing that I'm going to send out to you later today, and you might have already seen this, all right, you might have already seen this. And now I'm looking here. It says, where do I join your class sessions? All right, well, let me grab this. Let's see. Sorry about this, but if somebody can't get on right now, I want them to be able to. So let me change this so that I'm able to get them in here. OK, so I got an email and you probably got the same one, but I'm just in case you didn't, I want to show this to you from Crystal Heron, really terrific person. She's one of our VPs here. She's the vice president for student success. And um, what she said was typically they bring all students. It's mandatory that all students, including online students, attend a new student orientation. All right. Well, 
what they've done is they have taped that and they're going to put that out on Microsoft Teams. All right. Now it says it says you can look for it. Uh, it says where to go into the home page on Inside Rank and look for it. After she sent that out this morning, somebody must have sent back to her and said, hey, the presentation isn't there because she said they're loading it now. So if you've got questions about things with a handbook, that's what you should do is go out and watch that presentation. All right, and that's what I'm telling you here. All right, so work ethic. If you're not aware of this, you actually get two grades from Rankin for every class that you take. The one grade is your typical A, B, C, or F, and the other one is a work ethic grade. And it's very hard for me to have a work ethic grade in this class because you're not with me, I don't see you, etc. but I want to show you what they are real quickly. All right, you typically get one of three or four different grades. All right, so let me make this nice and big so hopefully you can see it. You can get a DNM, and that means does not meet. What does that mean? That means you don't come to class or you don't turn in assignments or both. All right, you're disrespectful in class, etc. All right, I don't think I've ever given one of those out in, you know, since in my tenure here. The next one is NI, and that means needs improvement. I have given out a few of those over my tenure here, but not really very many. All right, and what is that? That that is, yeah, you come to class, but you know, you 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 uh, have a tendency every other assignment isn't done, or you turn in a lot of incomplete work, etc. All right, then there's an ME, and that's what most people get, and that's meets expectations. That means you come to class, you do the homework, you do everything you're asked to do. All right, then the last one is an EE which means exceeds expectations. And I have people occasionally ask me, well, how do I get an EE? Well, those are the people that, um, for instance, I had a guy uh, a, a couple semesters ago, he started a study group online, okay? He literally set up a group where he contacted all of the people in the class. He asked me first if he could have their email addresses. So I went, and I emailed all those people saying, is it OK if I give them your email address? All right. And then he sent out a thing to all of them saying, hey, we'd, I'd like to have a study group if you're interested. And, and people would drop in and drop out on occasion. Well, that's going above and beyond the call of duty. All right. So it's things like that. It's people who do more than they're expected to do. All right. So in just a couple minutes, we're going to start looking at the book and you're start, going to start to get your introduction to HTML, to CSS, and to JavaScript. Now, JavaScript is going to be really the first time, and again, it won't be until about day 31, where we'll actually do some actual coding. All right, we'll write some code. One of the libraries, or one of the things that you can use with JavaScript is something called jQuery. So again, don't worry about that for right now. Between the time that we switched textbooks, so after we're done with the HTML5 CSS3 textbook and before we go into the JavaScript textbook, we're going to talk about a system that does a lot of automation for you. It's a lot of stuff where you just drag and drop. All right, and that's something called bootstrap. So you're going to be working with that as well. All right, now every semester at the end of the semester all students have to create an electronic portfolio please don't worry a bit about what that is all right i had people last semester the first class they took was a class in c-sharp programming so they knew nothing about how to develop a portfolio so what i did was i i, I showed them a drag and drop tool and I went through and I made a portfolio for them. You can literally do it in about 10 or 15 minutes. All right. And then the last thing that we're going to do in here that's shown on here is an intro to Git, and it really should say intro to Git slash GitHub, 
We're going to go into that in just a couple minutes, just so you know that. All right. So the idea is between today and tomorrow, we're going to do all the stuff I mentioned to you. So in a couple minutes, we're going to download Visual Studio. When we get done with that, all right, we're going to download Git. When we get done with that, we're going to set up a GitHub account. After we do all that stuff, after all of that has been completed, all right, then we're going to go into the book. And at a minimum, we'll go through chapter one today. All right. And then tomorrow, if we get all that done today, and we should, tomorrow then we'll go over chapters two and three. And you may think, wow, we're really going through this really, really quickly. Yeah, we are. But remember, we have about 30 days to get through our first book so that we can get into the other book. Now, if there ever comes a time where you think you're going way too fast, I'm just not picking up any of this. It is your responsibility then to let me know. All right. And if we have to slow it down for a day or so, we'll do that. What you'll see on the on here is that'll be the day on the schedule. Then in the middle here, it'll be what we're doing. And then on the right will be any work that's future work that's due. All right. And then down here, you can see lecture and lab for chapter one. Now, I don't want to do it at this second, but before the end of class today, all right, um, after we download it, Git and GitHub, and hopefully you're all able to bring that information over, I'll show you the type of homework that's going to be due for your chapters. I don't want to get into it right now, all right? But what I'd like to do instead of that, so that's today. Like I said, tomorrow, it'll be really chapters two and three, okay? Because uh, so if we do chapters two and three tomorrow, then this day right here will be replaced. It'll be lab for the entire period. And that's what I'd much rather do. I started doing that last semester with both my classes, giving them labs on Friday. And there were people who literally sent me emails saying this is pretty much a godsend because since I've got to get work done by Sunday, it's nice to know that I, I'm not sitting there learning other more new stuff on Friday that I've got time that I can actually spend working on my homework. But again, notice the first set of assignments will not be due until a week from Sunday or 11 days from today. Also, as you see right here, there will be no class next Monday. All right, that is the observance for Martin Luther King Day. So you'll already have your first test on Tuesday of next week. Before you let that, you know, just throw you and you say, oh, my God, how am I going to get ready? Except we're going to basically do the stuff that's going to be on there together as a class between today and tomorrow. All right. And the way that tests work, the, these hands on tests, the way that they work is I will send you the test by 7 a.m. You will have the test emailed to you by 7 a.m. So by the 17th, then at eight o'clock, I will spend 15 minutes going over what the test is all about. Now, some people are watching this recording live. Some people are working right now at their jobs and watch it when they get home. So for hands on tests, they are due by midnight the night they're given. So in other words, this test will be passed out at 7 a.m. and will be due by 11.59.59 p.m. All right, hopefully that makes sense to you. But what that says is if you've got from 7 a.m. until midnight, you have basically 17 hours to fit to work on the test. All right, that's all I want to say for right now about this. So before I go on, and we're about to go in and download Visual Studio. Does anyone have any questions on anything that I just went over on the syllabus? Anybody? Um, yes. Uh, right there at the end, um, you said that uh, hands-on tests are due. Uh, can you repeat that uh, last yes. part? Uh, yes. Hands-on tests are due on the day they're given. So in other words, you will get the test 
the one that's in gray right there, you will get that by 7 a.m. on Tuesday. It will be due by midnight or 11.59.59 p.m. on Tuesday. Okay. All right, everything else will be the due dates that are shown on the right. Okay, thank you. And sure, anybody else have any questions on the on the syllabus thus far? All right, then what I'm uh, going sir? to do, yes. So for the books for the class, um, do we buy those at the bookstore? That's up, that's totally up to you. I'm, of course, I'm supposed to highly encourage people to use the Blackhawk or the Blackhawk, the uh, Rankin bookstore. Okay, I'm supposed to highly encourage that because that keeps the bookstore in service. Now that said, if you go online and you go out to Amazon and you can find a used one or you can you can literally go out to Muroc, that's the name of, our, the, of the book publisher, and you can buy a, a PDF from them. So you can buy it from wherever you can get copies. I did send out, everybody should have gotten from me a PDF with the first three chapters on there. Now, believe it or not, and if, if you didn't get it, that's that's okay. I'll make sure you do, but this is your first set of homework. But what I'm going to do, and I don't normally do this, but what I am going to do, and I will put this, you will get another email from me at the end of class today. That email will have a hyperlink on there for the video that I'm doing right now, and it'll have some additional information. What I'm going to ask is that by Friday, everybody in the class just sends me an email that says, I can get your emails and you know I, I can see the first lecture or whatever. Just doing that, I'm gonna give you 10 points for doing it. And if you don't do it by Saturday morning, you're just going to get a zero, OK? It won't be factored into your regular grades, but I, I'm giving people the opportunity to start with 10 points just out of the gate for just sending me an email and then just saying, hey, I, I, I could, I could, I'm getting the emails from you, et cetera, and, and, um, and I can see the, the videos that you're putting out there. All right, OK, so let me come in here. And I'm going to close a bunch of stuff. I will tell you that's my granddaughter. And so if you see, you'll probably see her a lot during the semester and just so people know that. So I'm going to come out here and I'm I'm going to start with Visual Studio Code. Now, I already have it on my system, so I'm going to remove it and then I'm going to add it back so you can follow me and follow everything that I'm doing here. All right, so let me just get rid of it. There it is, Microsoft Visual Studio Code, right there. And you can see that the last time I had it was literally 12, 2022, 20, so mine is not very old, but I'm gonna get rid of it anyway. All right, it's now gone. It says this user thing here. I don't even know what that is. I'm not worried about that, but I'm going to install it right now. So if you don't have it on your system, and my guess is you probably do not, all right, that you follow along with me. And if something doesn't work or doesn't make sense, please let me know, all right? So the easiest way to do this is to just come up here and into your address bar, type in Visual Studio Code Download. Now you don't have to do that because I'm just going to show it to you. So here, download Visual Studio Code. There it is. So let me put this up there and let me make it big enough where you can all see it. I'll make this bigger. Now, when you do this, just so you know, and you're going to, this is part of what this class is about, you don't need to add this. So you can just type in that code.visualstudio.com. And I believe it gets you right to the download page itself, but I, I'm going to try it like this. Just code.visualstudio.com. That's what I'm going to type in in just a moment. Code.visualstudio.com. 
So let me type that in here. I'll, I'll bring it right back. Code, oops, get rid of everything that's in here. Code.visualstudio.com. All right. Now you can notice it looks a lot different than the other one, and that's okay. So this is what I just typed in. This is the editor that we will be using. It's called Visual Studio Code. The reason that this is important is the, the editor that was used by students last semester was called Visual Studio. Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code are two different things. And if you say, I don't understand, you don't have to. But if you go out to code.visualstudio.com, my guess is and my hope is that you're all using Windows. Now, if you've got a Macintosh machine, yours might say here, download for Mac, all right, or an Apple machine or a Linux machine. But the stuff will work best for this class if you've got a Windows machine. All right, so I'm going to click right here where it says download for Windows. And you'll notice if I click the down arrow, there's the other ones. Okay, but my it already is, the, the system is already determined that I have Windows. So I'm just going to click on that. And now way down in the bottom left-hand corner of my screen, you may not be able to see it, but it's downloading the executable file that holds Visual Studio Code. All right, it's way down because I'm using Chrome. If you're using another browser, it might be up here or someplace else. But I'm going to right mouse click, right mouse click on that, and I'm going to choose Open. When you do this, this is what should come up. You may, your machine may, may give you a little beep and it may say that you need to be uh, an administrator to do this. Do you want to keep doing it? And just say yes. That's all you got to do. The download for this is extremely simple, in my humble opinion. You click here where it says I accept the agreement, right there, and then you click next. Now, it says right here, do you want to create a desktop icon? If you check that, it'll put a thing over here on your desktop where you can start Visual Studio Code from there. Just to show you, I'll check it. I recommend that you have all of these checked. You technically don't need to check any of them, except really you should make sure the last one is. All right, but I recommend just checking all of these, then click Next. All right, and it says this is what you're about to install on your computer and click install. As you can see, it's going through the installation process right now. You can also see your, your may be going slower. It all depends on your Internet connection. All right, now you don't have to launch Visual Studio yet, so I'm going to uncheck that. And I'm going to click finish. I now have Visual Studio available to me. And if you say, well, how do I know that? I'm going to show you it in a minute. But I want to give people who might have a slower internet connection, I want to give them the time where they've got time to go and download this. All right, so just let me give it a minute or so. And again, this is the editor that we will be using this semester. And a question I get asked sometimes, are there other editors? Yes, there are. Can I use a different editor if I want to? Yes. To me, this is the easiest to use, most intuitive editor there is. I'm not a big Microsoft guy, but I give Microsoft kudos for this product because I think it's a very good product. All right, now if you want to be able to make sure that you have this and if it's up and running the easiest way if you look right now i now have this icon up on my desk right here kind of looks like a bow tie or something or a tie and it's blue and you probably you really should have the same one down below well it looks like i don't but that's fine all right if you don't have this here if you do have it you can double click on it and that'll start it up if you don't have it you can go into your Windows search box that's down in your bottom left-hand corner and go in there and just type in Visual Studio Code. 
And it should show like that right here. All right, and if I click on the, the link here, it'll start it up. And it looks just like this. Don't worry if yours looks a little different than mine, you don't have this, etc. Don't worry about it. If you get this, that's fine. It's just letting you know basically, well, version you're using, etc. So you can click that X up there and you can close it. Now it doesn't look like much, but that's very, very important that we were able to get that done. So I don't want to put anybody on the spot because sometimes people will tell me I went through all the steps and it didn't work. But I'll tell you what, if for some reason I just went through these steps and if either A, I went through them too quickly or B, you think you did them and it didn't work, send me an email. All right. And if I have to, I'll work one on one with you to get that to work. All right. Now we're going to take a break in a few minutes, but before we do, let's do the second download. All right, remember I said there's three of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back up here and now I'm going to type in here. Git download. All right, and it's going to take me to right here and I want to show you this. So first, let me show you the URL that you should be typing in next. So the first one was right there, code.visualstudio.com. And the second one, let me move this down. There we go. The second one is here. And again, you don't need this. And I don't think you even need the downloads. Git hyphen scm.com. All right, git hyphen scm.com right there. And again, it'll come back in just a moment, so don't worry about it. But I'm going to put that in there and hit enter. You see, I get right to where we were before. All right, so let me bring that back up. OK. Now, SCM stands for Source Control Manager. That's what Git is. If that makes absolutely no sense to you, it's totally fine. It really and truly is totally fine. It's going to be a way that you're going to be able to. Pre when you have your homework done, you're going to be able to get it to me without having to email me different things. All right. You're going to basically be using Git and GitHub, and that's how you'll get your homework to me. We're going to go through all that in just a moment. Now, the, uh, when we get started, and I'm taking for granted everybody had a chance to do this, all right, and you're here. We can just type right, or click right here, but before we do, sometimes people say, you know, this Git is kind of neat, but I really wish I knew more about it. Well, if you go down to here where this is actually a book, and it's online for free. So if you click on there where it says Pro Git, this is basically anything you'd want to find out about, about Git. Do you have to know all that stuff? Heck no. I'm using the 80-20 the rule. I'm giving you the 20% of the stuff that you'll use 80% of the time. And in this class, I'm giving you 20% of the stuff that you'll use 100% of the time. All right, so what I'm going to do before this, I've already got Git on my system, so I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to go to my control panel, and I'm going to get rid of Git, and I'm going to download it with you. So let me find Git in here. There it is. I'm going to right mouse click and choose uninstall. This is where it says you need administrator permissions. If you get that, just click the yes. It says, are you sure you want to remove it? Yes. And you'll notice this Git right here in just a moment. As soon as I click this, it's now gone. All right, so I'm going to reinstall it right now. OK, download for Windows. I'm going to click on that. And it says click here to download the 64 bit version. My guess is that every one of you has a 64 bit computer. If your computer is five years old or less, you've got a 64 bit machine. If you've got a 10 year old machine, it could be 32 bit but you probably don't. So I'm going to click right here where it says click here to download. And again, it's going to bring it down here. OK, again, I'm going to right mouse click on it and choose open when done. It is done, so it's going to come in here and it's going to say that. And now it's going to give me very similar stuff to what we had before. This is a little bit. It's not a more difficult download, but it's a little more complicated download. So I'm going to click next. 
and it says where you want this to go, and it gives you a default location. Now, you can change that because it's your machine. I'm going to leave that right under my CDM files, so it'll give you some kind of a default location in here. You can click Browse to change it if you want to. I'm just going to use the default, so I'm going to click Next. And it says the folder already exists. Would you like to install it anyway? You shouldn't get that, but since I already have, even though I removed Git, it kept the folder, so I'm going to say yes. So now it says in here, which of these things do you want? I'm going to recommend just leaving it the way it is. Now, <clears throat> there are different ways that you can use Git. I want you to understand this. There are different ways that you can use this. I have been told by students in the past, well, the way you do it is kind of the harder old fashioned way. I disagree. I'm going to show you how to use Git Bash. All right. So make sure that these are all checked. There is a product called Git for the desktop. If you want that, you can click on here. If you want to make sure you have everything, you can just click right there. I'm going to leave it exactly the way it is with these one, two, three, four, five, six things checked, and I'm going to click Next. Now it says, let's see, select Startup Menu Folder. All right. Basically, I want it to start with Git. So again, I'm going to click Next again. And now it says, what's the default editor you're using? And believe it or not, you can come down here. You can find Visual Studio Code. It's in here someplace. All right, but it really and truly doesn't matter what you choose there. It doesn't. So I'm just going to click Next. And it says, let let Git decide or override the default. I'm just going to let Git decide on here, and I'm going to click Next again. So you'll notice what I'm doing is I'm just accepting all of the default values, period. All right, and I'm going to click Next again, and I'll leave that, and I'll click Next again, and I'll leave that, and I'll click Next again, and I'll leave that, and I'll click Next again, Leave that and click next again. One more time, I think. The default, click next again. Looks like one more. Click next again and again. I'm going to leave this exactly the way it is, and I'm going to click install. And again, your speed might might differ. So if you're a little bit behind, it's not a problem. And I'm going to click. Uh, I don't want to restart my computer. All right, because I lose all of you. So no, I will restart it later. Whether you restart or not is up to you. I would recommend not doing that now because again, you'll lose your 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 contact with me. So I'd recommend you choose no and just finish. There's a very, very, very easy way for you to tell whether or not this worked. All right. And that is you come over to your desktop here and just right mouse click on your desktop in an empty area, right mouse click. And if you've got a thing here that says Git GUI here, Git Bash here, all right, if you've got that where my mouse is right now, your install worked correctly. If you don't, there was some kind of a problem. All right. You also should be able to come into here, and again, down in your Windows Start menu, I should be able to come in here and type in, not got, I should be able to type in git, and there it is, git bash. And don't worry about that. We'll, we'll work on that later. That's not a big thing. All right, so the good news is that of the three things that we were supposed to download today, those being Visual Studio Code, Git, and GitHub, and GitHub isn't a download, it's setting up an account. We've done two of them, all right? It is nine o'clock right now. What I like to do is I like to go in on the hour, give a 10 minute break. So I'm gonna leave this up and running, all right? But uh, we'll come back at 9.10, we will set up a GitHub account 
And then after that, we will go through chapter one of the text. OK, I'll see you back here in 10 minutes.
All right, I'm back and just to quickly review, we went through the introduction. I showed you where the handbook is. I talked about work ethic. I mentioned that this class will be primarily HTML, CSS and JavaScript, but we will learn a little bit about the JavaScript uh, library, jQuery, and we'll learn about Bootstrap as well. I mentioned that uh, you will have an electronic portfolio that will be due at the end of the semester. We also downloaded Visual Studio Code and we downloaded Git. Again, Git is a version control manager. And if you don't know what that means, we're gonna start looking at it already today, just so you can see what I'm talking about. All right. Now, the other thing we wanna do is we wanna go into GitHub. Now, it's very simply just github.com. Mine is going to look totally different than yours when you go into it. So I'm gonna change mine in just a minute so it looks like yours. But literally, all you have to type in here, and I'm, I'm saving all these URLs, and I'll make sure that they all get sent out to you today. Again, you don't need any of this. You can just put in github.com. GitHub is designed to work with Git, and basically, for lack of better words, what it will do is it'll save any work that you want to save out to the cloud. If you take stuff that you create and you make it private, you're the only one who can see it. That's what you're going to do. But after you make something private, you can send out invites so that other people can see it. And the only invite that I'll ask you that you send out for this class is to me. And I'll show you exactly what that means and how to do it in just a little bit. Again, I'm not going to get rid of my GitHub. I tried doing this one semester and it took almost two weeks to get it back again. So I don't wanna do that. Now, what I do, what I am gonna do though, is if I come in here right now and I log out, if I were to come in here and log out, then mine would look like yours. But I always have problems, even though I know what my GitHub password is, sometimes for whatever reason, it doesn't accept it. So I'm going to go into what's called incognito mode. All right, so I'm going to right here, I'm going to do a control shift N. My screen gets black, that's fine, don't worry about it. But I'm going to just type in here github.com. Exact same thing. So this is probably what yours looks like. At least my hope is that this is what yours looks like. All right. And you want to click the button over here that says sign up. And again, there shouldn't be any costs or anything else in here. All right. When it says enter your email, please put in your rank in email. If you've got your own Gmail or your own Hotmail or your own Yahoo, except please don't use that. Please put in your rank in email email address all right so i'm just going to make one up see my my actual address is jp scott at rankin.edu yours is probably your first initial middle initial last name at inside rankin.org so i'm just going to use that i'm going to say fm l name at inside rankin i think it's inside rankin like this dot org all right but you won't put that in you will put in your actual Rankin email address i'm only going to go a certain amount with this because i don't want to create a new account because there is no fml name to my knowledge so i'm going to click there and i'm going to click continue it says email is invalid or already taken all right i'll tell you what i'll do um so it doesn't like that. So let's just say, I don't have one, but I'm gonna try saying JP Scott, JP 
scott at at insiderankin.org like that. I, I don't know if it'll take that or not, but we'll see. And continue. Still doesn't like it. Well, hopefully when you put yours in, it took it. Now, I've, I've, I've got a bunch of different... What's that? Uh, mine, uh, mine did the same thing as well. Uh, it said uh, username incorrect or... Uh, it's saying already, that it's invalid or already taken? Okay. Yeah. I think uh, there's no uh, underscore. Okay, then let's try it like that. I'll, okay. I'll take your okay. word for it. So, whoops. So, JP Scott at insiderankin.org. All right, and continue. That was it. Then create a password. All right, that password, either write it down. All right, you don't share that with anybody, of course, but write it down. Make sure you don't forget it. I have done this before where I've had to go out to, to GitHub and have them change the password. It's gotten better over the years. It used to be it took a day before they would let, I'll even get back to you to change it. So I'm just going to put in here P-A-S-S-W-0-R-D for password. All right. It says it may be compromised. Well, it'll, what all it's saying is that's pretty simplistic. You really shouldn't use that. It's fine. I'm going to click continue anyway. Well, maybe it doesn't like that. So I'll see if I put in comma, comma, comma there. Now it says it's strong. So I put in P-A-S-S-W-0-R-D, comma, comma, comma. And now it's telling me that it's strong. So let's see. It says make sure it's at least 15 characters or eight characters, including a number and a lowercase letter. I've got that. So I'm going to click. You to put in for your username here is again whatever your email address is but so if yours was jp scott for example i just want you to say jp scott rankin now it'll say that it's not available because that's mine but if your name is john smith you can say john smith rankin and you'll notice that that's available do you have to do it that way the the problem is if you put in something else sometimes unless unless you send me the right invite it's very hard for me to find what yours is but if i you know i know everybody's first initial middle initial and last name it makes it much easier for me so again i put in john smith rankin and i'm going to click continue and it says would you like to receive product updates that's totally up to you i could care less so i'm going to type in an n right here for no all right and click continue again and now it says, please resolve this puzzle to verify that you're a human. Click start puzzle to continue. This is new. I haven't seen this before. So start puzzle. Pick one square that shows two identical objects. Well, it looks on mine at least like it's this one. If you've never seen this kind of thing before, this is known as a CAPTCHA. All right. And basically, it's trying to prove that you're not a robot that you're an actual human being. So I'm going to click here. And it's got that. OK, so everything looks good. So it says create account. So I'm going to click there and create account. All right, it says you're almost done. We sent the launch code. Well, I don't have a JP Scott at insiderankin.org. I don't have that. So I'm not going to be able to go any further. OK, you'll have to go out to your Rankin email and it should give you a code with a bunch of letters and or numbers and you put them in here. So if it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, for example, you'd put that in. Now it says invalid, but hopefully with yours, it will be valid. <clears throat> and this has changed since the last time I've done it. So hopefully you got that to work. And then I don't know if there's any other steps or not, but eventually, what you should then be able to do is to go out to github.com, as I showed you, and it may ask the first time for you to log in, or it may recognize you. All right? Don't worry that I've got all this stuff out here. I've already created what are called a bunch of repositories. Okay? In fact, when I come out here... <clears throat> When I come out here and I start to look for my repositories, I probably have well over 100 of them out here. So don't worry about if yours doesn't look anything like this.
I'll give you a second, hopefully, that you'll have time to go and look that up, get the launch code, launch it, and bring it up. And again, sometimes people feel funky about saying, hey, I had problems with this. And if that's the case with you, then after class, just send me an email. I will work with you individually on this. All right. I've never really seen a situation where after a little bit of finagling or whatever, if we've had to do that, that we can't get it to work for people. All right. <clears throat> once you get into this, once you get into this, all right, what I'd like you to do, I think this is the way it's going to work, but if it doesn't, you're going to tell me, is when you get to this where it says search or jump to, type in here, J.P. Scott Rankin. That's me, J.P. Scott Rankin and hit enter. Okay, it may look like this. It may not look exactly like this and don't worry about it. <clears throat> it's interesting what it's showing me here. So let's see. That should be me to my knowledge. That's me. So let me double check. Yeah, J.P. Scott Rankin. All right. What should be in here is you should be able to find a repository. If what I'm going to show you now doesn't work, don't worry, because I'll show you how you can make it work. All right, so let's see. There it is. If for some reason you had any problem with that, key in this. I will make it bigger so you can see it right now. It didn't work, so let me copy it again. Well, I do have it out here as well, so. Well, I'm I'm not really uh it's not sending an email to my uh Yeah. It 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 should be on one that's what I'm looking for. It's on one of these emails. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I mean uh, probably because there's no underscore used uh during the you know, whenever I, I put it in at first when I created the the account, uh I mean I, I assume uh, I'm not sure if that, that's why it's not even saying I'm trying to go in my get it let me into my profile whenever I click get your email address. Um and I'm, I'm trying to change it to where I can link my you know with an underscore but right. okay really, uh, well then pr what what you might have to do is you might have to go in and set up go back in again and set up a brand new account. Okay. Okay. Now, for the rest of you, what you should be able to type in, and everybody can type this in, into your address bar is this. Okay, it's a little big. It's all on one line. Let me make it a little smaller so you can see all of it on one line. There. You probably, again, you probably don't need this but you will need all of this. Okay. Now, if you put that in, okay, this is the what's called a GitHub repository. This will have all, not your, not your hands-on tests, but this will have all of the written tests you have to do for this class, all of the labs you have to do for this class, all of the homeworks you have to do for this class. It's all in there for the entire semester. All right. So again, this is the address for what's called a GitHub repository. And I apologize to whoever said that. I, I, I screwed up with putting in that underscore. I guess it didn't like that. 
All right. See, last semester, I didn't even take students as far as I've taken you. I just told them what to do. Maybe I should have done it that way this semester because everybody, everybody got it without a problem. All right, but that was on me for putting that underscore in there, so I apologize for that. So if I type go in there and put in that, and I'm going to go back into that incognito mode that I was in before. All right, so give me a second to go back into that, and that is what? Control Shift N. So I'm going to come in there, and I'm putting in the exact same thing I just showed you. HTTPS colon slash slash github.com slash JP Scott Rankin slash your name AWD 1000 spring 2023 and I'm going to hit enter. Hopefully when you do it, yours should look like this. All right. Now what you have to do then. I, I apologize. To, is that is that your name specifically or do we can insert no our name? You're you're going to change that eventually to your to your particular name. But for now, okay. it should be just like this. That's a good question. Okay. All, All right. right. I didn't want to put Jeff Scott in there because that confused people when I did that before. So I changed it to your name. So if your name is John Smith, after you get it copied over, you're going to change that to John Smith. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. All right. So in order to be able to copy all this work over now, it's it's actually pretty simple. You click, there's different ways of doing it. I'm going to show you what I consider the easiest way to do it. And that is where it says code here. Click this down arrow button and choose download zip. Now it may take a couple of minutes because it's it's quite a big file. So now in my downloads folder, I now have a zipped copy of everything that we need for the entire semester. So I'm going to pretend my name is John Smith. And I'm going to click on this. And I'm going to change your name to John Smith. I recommend don't put any blank spaces in here because it'll screw things up. All right. And I don't need this slash master on the end. So I changed the name of it. Again, I'm assuming my name is John Smith. So it now says John Smith, AWD 1023. I don't know why it left the master in there after I told it to remove it, but there it is. All right, that is what's called a zipped file. Now I'm hoping you have an unzip software on your computer. You'll know real fast because I'm gonna show you how you can tell. If you've got this file, Right, take your mouse and right mouse click on it. And I'm hoping you've got a thing there that says extract all. If you do not, if you don't have anything like that, all right, and it may not be exactly where mine is. You might have to look for it on one of these things that have got the arrows on it. You may have to look there. But if you don't have it, then you can go and there are different packages. One of my students last semester used this 7-zip. He went out, I think it is just 7-zip.com and downloaded it from there. All right. But if you do have something that says extract all, just click that. And it says, where do you want to put it? I'm going to put it right where I am right now. So I'm going to click extract. Now, again, this may take a minute or two. And it's going to it's going to depend on the, your internet connection. So if I'm ever going through anything, I'm doing it based on my internet connection. So if I'm going too fast, please stop me. I'm not trying to go too fast. All right. And sometimes I, I fail to realize people have older machines or they have a, a bad internet provider or whatever, because it can happen. So there it's done. So now I've got a regular folder. I've got a zip folder and a regular folder. All right. And that regular folder, if I double click on it with my left mouse, this is basically what we're going to have in here for this semester. Now it says your name. Don't worry about that. 
but it's got it here. Here's the HTML CSS stuff. So this is the stuff we'll be doing for the first 30 days. And this is the stuff we'll be doing for the last 50 days. Here's another copy of the syllabus. I can't make this any bigger, just so you know. But if I double click, they're, they're both set up the same, but if I double click on the HTML CSS one, here are all of your homework assignments for the entire semester. Here's a PDF explaining what those assignments are, and the assignments are actually right here. All right, if I go back, same kind of thing with my labs. So these are the PDFs that explain what all these labs here are and what you have to do. All right, and then here are the slides. These are the PowerPoint presentations that the author gives. I don't know if I'm supposed to give you those or provide them or not. I don't care. All right. And if you say, well, I can't open those. I don't have Microsoft Word. You can go down. You should be able to go out and just um, go out to Google. And uh, there's a Google Slides, I think, that you can uh, download. And you can do it from there, too. And then this is the student download. So this is what the book provides. All right. So in other words, these are the applications that are in your textbook right here. All right, these are more examples that are in your book. And these where it says exercise and solutions, that's the exercises that are at the end of every chapter. All right, and then finally, we've got written tests. Yeah, you're gonna have to do written tests. They're all multiple choice. And they'll look like this. So a web browser, and when you do this yourselves, all right, usually what I have people do is they just grab this and let's just say that's A. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to look at it right now. But if it's A, what people usually do is they highlight it like this and then just go over to home and just change the color of their font maybe to red or something like that to, to signify that that's the right answer. Or you can just do it on the letter. You can do it any way you want as long as I know what you're doing. All right. Now, I'm not going to run through that much in detail, but just so you know, in the other folder that we'll use starting on around day 30, again, there's your homeworks, there's your labs, there's your slides. There's there's the uh, download from the stuff in the book, and there's your written tests. All right. So you now have all the information that you need. Okay, that's all fine and dandy. What I am going to do, all right, what I am going to do is I'm going to pretend right now, I'm going to go out and I'm going to pretend that I want to go and, and actually take all this stuff. You don't have to do what I'm about to do. I want to show you what we're going to do here. All right. If I decided that I wanted to come in here and take all of this stuff and send it back to GitHub, let's say that I've never done it before. This is something I just created and I want to send it to GitHub. I want to show you the steps. Don't do these because you've already got that stuff out on GitHub. All right. If you uh, copied it over. But so basically what you do is you come in here. I'm going to put all this stuff down so you're going to have the commands. So you don't have to worry about writing them down. But you come down here and you do a git bash here, right there. All right. Oops. So you do a git bash here. That's the first thing that you're going to have to do. Make this bigger so you can read it. OK, so let me write down these steps here. So these were all the things that we went and copied. And let me come down here. So number one, oops, do a git bash here. All right, then for number two, you type in, right now if I type in git status, it's gonna give me an error. So if I type in git status, it says you don't have any repository. All right, there should be a special folder here that says dot git. I'm gonna show you the command to do this. Now, if you don't have your, your show hidden extensions and file names, it may not show on yours but it'll be there. So I'm going to type in right now, 
get in it. Get in it. When I hit enter, watch what happens up here. I will have a folder. It'll look almost cloudy. It won't look as bright as these, but it'll say dot git on the name. So I hit enter. There's my dot git right there. So now, now if I were to come in and type in its status like I did before, it gave me an error. But if I type it in now, it shows me there's a bunch of stuff in here that I haven't put into it yet. So, so far, and again, you don't have to do this. All right. What I hope to be able to do tomorrow is we will do one or more of the assignments together as a class. I'll show you how to commit them, and then you will take those and you will upload those to GitHub. So you don't have to worry about following my steps right now. And again, I'm writing them down anyway. So we did the git bash here. So right mouse click. And we chose, so choose git bash here. Then from the command line, we did a git init. All right. So we now have that git folder on there. Then from the command line, we're going to type in git add dot. And that's going to add everything, everything that it showed right here. Now you might look at that and go, from what I just showed you here, there's not much in there. This is the folders and everything that's in them. So just like I just showed you, if I want to clear my screen, I can just type in clear, but I'm going to type in git add dot and hit enter. Now you might get these error messages. All right. And I went, the, the first time that happened, to, I, at least one person just really got freaked out and they said, hey, this isn't right. I did something wrong. You did nothing wrong. S with some systems, when you hit the enter key, it does what's called a line feed, which is an LF. With some other systems, when you hit the enter key, it does a CRLF, which is carriage return line feed. They're the same thing. It's just telling you it's going to replace all LFs with CRLFs. It's totally fine. All right. Now, if I come in and I type in get status, if you remember just a minute ago when I did it, it was red, now it's all green and it's showing me all of now. These are all of the things that it's loading. So that's everything. All right. Now, there's two more things that I have to, or three more things that I have to do here. So I want to show you these. Now, this is called from right here. It's still called. It's called your name. You know, et cetera, dot master, just like that. It's got that. All right. Now I'm going to go back to GitHub and this is something you will have to do eventually. Please don't do it now. I'd rather have us do it together tomorrow, but I'm going to come back up here. All right. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to, let's see. I don't want to be in incognito mode anymore. I want to be back in my regular mode. So from GitHub, I want to come in here and I'm going to click over here. There's a plus sign right there. I'm going to click on that plus sign and I'm going to choose new repository. All right. Now with mine, with the owner, you may have this, you may not. But if you do, you want to choose, of course, your name. I've got some stuff that was created for rank, and that's why I've got two of them. You may not. It's totally fine. So I'm going to paste that in. So notice what it was. It was, whoops, was your name, AWD 1000 Spring 2023 Master. I already have one that looks like this. See that? So it says you can't use that. That already exists. But I purposely left the master on that one so I'd be able to do this again. All right. So once I do that, what you are going to do is you're going to click private. You are going to click private. And that'll mean you're the only one who can see these unless you provide what's called an invite for people. 
I make all mine public so you can all see them. So with it public here, I'm going to come down here and click create repository. Now I will, well, that went real fast. This morning, I couldn't believe how long that took. It must have taken a minute or two. Then you want to come up here and I want to grab this line. It says get remote ad right there. I want to grab that line. I want to copy it to the clipboard. So I'm going to right mouse click on here and choose copy. Then I'm going to come back here. All right. And I'm going to put in that line. Get remote, add origin, et cetera. Yours will be different. Yours won't be JP Scott Rankin, et cetera. Yours will be different. So I'm going to grab that line. I copied it to the clipboard. And I'm going to put it. Let me clear my screen. And I'm going to put it right here. Now, most of you are probably used to, to when you do copies, doing a control V right here. Notice if I do a control V, it doesn't work. It didn't like it. So what you have to do instead is you have to right mouse click and choose paste. And it put it in there. Get remote add, et cetera. So I hit the enter key. All right. If I want to verify that that worked, I can type in get remote minus V. Don't worry, I've got a list of Git commands that I'm going to send to you. I didn't want to send too much stuff to you because you already might be feeling overwhelmed. All right, so if I hit enter, it says that's what it's using. That's what I want. There's only one more thing that I have to do. All right, and that is to put in this line right here. Now, I want to explain something to you that may make absolutely no sense. And if it makes no sense, it's okay for now. Make sure you're using HTTPS here and not SSH because it's different commands. So just use HTTPS right up here. All right. Now, when I created my GitHub account, I did it about five years ago. At that time, we weren't as politically correct of a society as we are right now. Why am I telling you this? Because when I did, did mine, it wasn't called main, M-A-I-N, like you see there. It was called master. All right. But to get with the times, GitHub decided about two years ago that they wanted to change and everybody's would be main instead of master. But if you created it earlier, you still have to use master. All right. Now that said, I have had students that have put in this line like this and it hasn't worked and they've had to use master. I have no idea why that is. None. But. What I want to show you is I'm going to grab this. I'm not going to grab the, the main, but I'm going to grab everything else and I'm going to copy it to the clipboard. Then I'm going to paste it into here. So let me clear again. And let me paste in by right mouse clicking and choosing paste. And now I'm going to add to the end of that master. And I'm going to hit enter. It's going to, oh, well, that's interesting. Okay, fail to push some refs. Right, let's do a git remote minus V. Wow, I know what the error is. It's it's telling me that there's not a communication between Git and GitHub, but I'm trying to figure out why. So let's see, fail to push some refs. That's there. This should be correct. Let me try it like this. And you're going to have all these steps, so don't worry about it. And if, hey, I'm going to screw stuff up because I decided I didn't want to make a tape doing this. I wanted to do it live so you could see everything that I'm doing here. So let me try this now. Um, I don't think this is going to work either, so let's try it. Well, what should have happened didn't happen, but what should have happened there 
is when I said get push minus U origin and then came in here like this. Well, let's try it again. So get push minus U origin master. All right, what should have happened in there is it, it looks like it spins a little bit. You'll get all these messages that come up in different stuff. All right, so this didn't work. I want to make this work because I want you to see this the right way. Okay, so let me do it like this. Let me clear this. In fact, let me exit from here. And please just watch. Don't try it but I want to show you this because I want it to work. I'm going to make a garbage thing right here. So I'm going to right mouse click. I'm going to put in a new folder right here. And I'm going to call it JPS garbage. Garbage. All right, why am I doing that? Because I want to show you the steps and that they do work. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to do a git bash here. Same stuff I just showed you. All right, so I'm going to type in git init. And again, you'll notice I have this. I'm going to put in a command. Don't worry what the command is. I'm just going to put this in. I'm going to say touch index.html, and it's going to make a new file there called index.html. You can see that. All right, I'm going to open up that file, and I'm just going to put some garbage in it. It doesn't matter what it is. This is just a test. OK, it doesn't matter what's in there, but I want to show you that the steps indeed do work. All right, so I've now got this. I'm going to right mouse. Well, I've got this open now, this garbage thing right here. And I'm going to type in here. Get status and you'll see it'll be in red index.html, which means it hasn't been added so I can move it to my repo. So what do I have to do? I have to say get add dot all right and now i now i just figured out why the other one didn't work but i'm going to run through all the steps with you anyway so git add dot all right now if i type in git status now that's green all right the problem is what i forgot to do was i forgot to type in a line i'm going to show you what that line is right now all right and i don't think i typed this in before i have to type in git commit minus m for message and then put in here garbage example just like that you can put anything you want to put in here it's just a message so i hit enter okay now i'm going to go back into github and i'm going to create a new repository that i'm going to call jps garbage so a new repo, hopefully I don't have one named that. I don't think I do. So JPS garbage. And hit enter. Says it's available. There it is. So I'm going to grab this line just like we just did. OK, and then we're going to go back and make the other one work. All right, so now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to grab that line. This is establishing the communication between Git and GitHub right there. That's what that's doing. And I'm going to hit enter. There it is. Now I'm going to say my Git push minus U origin master and hit enter. And I will not get an error message. There it worked. How do I know it worked? I go back into GitHub and where I see all this, I just refresh my screen. Okay. And there's my index.html file that I just showed you. This is just a test. Now let's go back and look at why the other one didn't work because I foolishly left off a line. All right, so let's put that line back in here. All right, after the git remote add origin, I have to put in git commit minus M and then in double quotes, some kind of a message. Then I can come in when I didn't do that before and do my git push minus u origin. You will say main, probably I say master. Those are all the steps. So let me grab this. 
and go back to the one that didn't work because of my own stupidity. Let's see. Let's go back there. Oh, where is it? That is in my. Downloads folder. There it is. John Smith, then in here, the year name. OK, and there it is. So I'm going to right mouse click on here again, and I'm going to choose my Git bash here like we did before. I shouldn't have to do all those steps again. If I type in Git status, it still has all my stuff in there. So I'm going to type in Git commit minus M. Another example, you can put anything you want in there. So another example and hit enter. Now, if I type in my git push minus u origin master, it should work. Because I left out a step before, I apologize for that. All right, as soon as my, my uh, cursor comes back again, you can see it's going and loading all that stuff in right now. It's a lot bigger than the last one was, so it takes a little while longer. And when that's done, I'm going to show you how we, again, go back to GitHub and prove that it worked. Right there, it's done, so I can clear. And now when I go back into my GitHub repository, all right, and I go back to the other one. So what I want to go to in here is I want to jump to that your name right there. And there it is. No, that isn't the one. It says four days ago. Uh, we want the one that has your name with master in it there it is and you notice one minute ago so everything is up there again now i probably because i foolishly skipped that step or maybe i did it too fast i could have confused any of you i understand that so what we will end up doing tomorrow is we will do at least one lab problem at least one homework problem and at least one written test as a class. So you will put them in your copy of this folder and then we will push them out to GitHub to make sure that that works. All right. So again, I apologize for forgetting that one step, but you know, maybe it was better that I did because it gave me a chance to explain a few things to you. All right. So now we have come in here and we went over the syllabus, we installed Visual Studio Code, we installed Git, you set up a GitHub account, and I ran through the steps with you to actually go through a GitHub upload, all right? There's an upload and a download. The download is when you grab information from GitHub and you copy it to your machine. That's what we did here when we clicked on code, and then we clicked on download zip. That was a download. What I just showed you right here, that was an upload. And if you remember from my from my message, I just put another example. So that's the message that you see right here. Typically, you're going to have a, a more descriptive exa example in that one. All right. And then we're going to take a break in a couple of minutes. But before we do, I want to explain to you why this is important. All right. Because what's going to happen throughout the semester is you are going to use that folder that I had everybody copy down just a few minutes ago, and you are going to do your homework in that folder. You are going to do your labs in that folder. You are going to do your written tests in that folder. You are also going to do your hands on tests in that folder. All right, so let's pretend for just a second, I, I just want to show you this, that if I go back in here 
and I go back into that same folder that we were just in here, this one, all right? And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a new file. You don't have to do this, but I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna add a new file. It'll be just, I'm gonna make just a simple text file. And I'm just gonna call it hello, hello.txt. And I'm gonna open it up and I'm gonna say, hello world, that's it. And I'm gonna save this. And you might say, fine, what the heck did you do that for? I wanna show you right now why I did that, all right? So I'm gonna go back here and back, still have this open, yes. Okay, now if I type in git status, notice what it shows me. It says the only thing that's changed since the last time you uploaded was hello.txt. That's the only thing that's new. So what do I wanna do? Well, I don't have to do all that stuff I did before. All I have to do is a git add dot, that added it. So now notice if I type in git status, now notice the hello.txt is in green. If it's red, that means it's not part yet. It's not ready to go out to GitHub. If it's green, it is. So now I'm gonna come in here and I'm going to say, whoops, I'm gonna say git commit minus M, and I'll put it in here for a message, added new hello.txt file. That's all I'm gonna put in there and hit enter. All right, now I'm going to say again, git push minus U origin, just like we did before, origin, whoops, master. Again, you may have to say main, you probably will, and hit enter. It's gonna go a lot faster because there was just the one file. So now notice if I go back again to GitHub, all right, you don't see it yet in here, but notice when I refresh, there is hello.txt now. So this is what you'll be doing. So you'll be coming in in your HTML. So in your homework, when you do an exercise for your homework, you'll be doing it in there, et cetera. We'll do one of these, like I said, tomorrow. So tomorrow we will go through, we will do a homework exercise, we will do a lab exercise, we will do a written test. We'll do all those as a class. You'll, you know, if you, if you follow along and you end up uploading those at a minimum, you'll have those and you'll get all the points for those. All right, okay. Now, after the break, and again, I sent this out to you earlier, but after the break, I'm going to close some of this stuff because I got way too much stuff open here. What we're going to do after the break is I am going to start going through your textbook. All right. Now, I've got a thing that's called Red Shelf that they provide for instructors. You don't have this. Sorry. And, and I can't I can't get it for you. Try that again and spell it right. Redshelf.com. All right, and I go in as Jeff, and it'll show me the books that I have on my shelf. And notice there is the Murox. Oh, and doggone it, I've got the old edition of the book. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna get a hold of them during the break. In fact, I don't have to do that. I've got what I sent to all of you. I sent all of you in an email the first three chapters of this book. So you should all have this. I'll just go off of here for today. There's the fifth edition. So what I'm going to do after the break is I'm going to go through chapter one. All right. I'm not going to go through any more than that because this was a heck of a lot to throw at you in one day. All right. But I'm going to go through all of chapter one. Then when we get done, that should be around 11 o'clock, I would guess, because we're going to take a break from 10 to 10, 10. That'll be it for today. Tomorrow, when we start, I'm going to lecture on chapter two. Then I'm going to lecture on chapter three. When we get done, we will go over and do the lab for chapter one, the homework for chapter one, and the written test for chapter one together. We will do those. I will show you how to go and put them into your files and folders how to go and get those up to your GitHub repository. All right, and between the, the lecture and going through the examples, that'll take most of the class period. All right, okay, it is 10 o'clock. 
Let's take a break. I've got to refresh my water, so I'll be back in a couple minutes and we will pick it up and start going through chapter one at 1010. We'll see you then.
All right, I am back and uh, we're going to go over chapter one right now. One thing I just wanted to show you quickly is again, when you look here, this was the syllabus. So next Tuesday, I think it was, is the chapters one to three hands on test. Now this, it's not gonna be a lot on there. All right, so don't worry about it right now. We'll talk about it beforehand, okay? So then of course, as you'd guess, we're gonna go over four and we're gonna go over five and we're going to go over six and then there'll be a test on chapters four, five and six. Then we'll go over seven and eight and nine. All right, it looks like in 10, but I don't know, somewhere in here. So then we'll have a test on chapter seven to 10. So when you look in here. All right, you can see what what these are all about. All right, so chapter one, which we're going to go over right now is an introduction to web development. Chapters two and three, which we'll go over tomorrow, will be on basically how to set up a basic web page. And then chapter three will be on how to structure it. That's what the first test will be on. And that's all on HTML. Then we'll go in in chapters four, five, and six. Those are all about CSS. HTML is an acronym that stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Technically, it's not a programming language. It's a markup language. Four, five, and six are on CSS, and CSS is cascading style sheets. All right. And eight, nine, and 10, you can see the stuff that's in there, but it's all going to be on trying to start to make this stuff look prettier, for lack of better words. All right. Now, one thing, if you have not looked at the book at all yet, totally fine, but if you have not, the way that these books work, just as an FYI for you, <clears throat> And I'm not going to go over the expanded table of contents. You can look at that if you want to or not look at that if you don't want to. All right, let me move this down quite a bit here. Let's see. They have an introduction here that explains how the book is set up, so I'm not going to run through that. All right, but the way that Muroc books work is typically 
on the left hand, the page that's on the left hand side of the book. All right, that page typically at least is um, all text and it's explanations. That's the even number page. The page on the right, the odd number page has either got some some uh, like a pic, uh, a website on it or some HTML stuff on it or some CSS or JavaScript or whatever. Then at the bottom of the page that's on the right, what they basically do, they meaning Muroc, the authors of the book, what they typically do is they kind of summarize the text that was on the left hand side, just so you're aware of that. All right. So this first section, as it says, the first eight chapters is going to present what they think you need to get going, for lack of better words. All right. What you're going to find as we're going through in here is I'm not going to sit and read out of the book to you. You know, I, I it's amazing. I, I can't tell you the number of times since I've been to Rankin that I've gone to, to staff meetings and in-service meetings and somebody will put up a PowerPoint presentation and they'll sit and read every slide to you verbatim. I don't know why people do that, but I don't see the need. All right. So chapter one has got a lot of it's, it's concepts and terminology. All right. So you can see in here they'll talk about as it says. That these are just introductory things. Sometimes I like to call this the 35,000 foot view. So in other words, you're in an airplane and you're looking down on it. All right, the airplane is way up in the air someplace. So you can see the different stuff that's in there. Okay. Now there may, I, I don't remember in version five if they the book or not. In version four of the book, in version four, they were using a different editor than Visual Studio Code. I think they've upgraded it to Visual Studio Code, what we're using for the fifth edition. But if if they're if they're going to talk about other editors in here, other than VS Code, I'm not going to go over that material because there's really no reason to do that. All right, so we'll talk about all this stuff again, the, the tools, etc., and then some different issues that are in here. All right, so. Again, a lot of this stuff in here is just terminology. Hopefully you all know this, but when you type in www, if you do type that in, to the address bar along with something that stands for World Wide Web. All right. And do you always have to type in www? No. Is are there times when you have to type in www? Almost never. Almost. All right. But we'll talk about that. What we want to get across in here more than anything in this first chapter is the difference between clients and servers. And the reason that that is so important is the class that you're in right now, AWD 1000 Web Development Technologies. This is a client side class. When you take your two classes in the second year of the program, those are AWD 1111, Database Driven Web Development 1, and AWD 1115 which is database driven web development two. Those are both server side classes. Right now we're, con we're concerned more with the client side. And if you say, I don't know what that means, we're looking at things basically from the user's perspective. Somebody, you're, you're creating a simple website for users to look at. What we're concerned more in the other two classes on the server side is we're looking at it from the machine's point of view. Now that that's a very general statement, and if it doesn't make any sense, it will when we when we start getting into it in more depth and breadth of coverage. Now you don't really get any hardware in this in this program, all right, other than probably this page right here. So they talk about a network, and typically networks are groups of computers that are linked together, either physically or in some other way. Now. You probably, most of you watching this, probably have never been to Rankin in person. And if you have, you probably haven't been up to the IT area that we have at, at, at both the St. Louis campus and at the Wentzville campus. All right. I'm technically out of the Wentzville campus. All right. But the point is, the machines that are, that are in the different labs are physically wired together to one another. 
there is a physical connection. That is what's typically referred to as a LAN or a local area network. On the other hand, believe it or not, the machines between St. Louis and Wentzville, which is a distance of about 40 miles, those machines also are connected to one another, but they're not directly connected. In other words, there's not wire that runs under I-70 for 40 miles that connects the two. Rather than that being a local area network, it's a wide area network, all right? And they're, they're basically linked together using routers. And, you know, if you read the page that's here, that's really all you need, all right? Then they talk a little bit about internet service providers. For instance, all right, my internet service providers, I get mine through Charter. All right, you might get it through somebody else. So what the internet basically is, as it says there, it's a global network of WANs, of wide area networks that are connected together. All right, now there's other things too. There's, there's internet, which we all know, there's intranet, there's extranet, all right? And the only time I'm gonna go over some of this stuff is if it's in the book, because I don't want to put in, you know, throw any more stuff at you than we have to. Now, you see the picture, hopefully, on the screen right now. And on that picture, where it says the internet, that's what people typically call the cloud. All right, when really, when, when we were using GitHub before, we were pushing things out to the internet someplace, to the cloud. The way that this picture has changed over the years is, th and they've had this, We've been using this book for several editions now, but back maybe in, I don't know, the third or the second edition, this said desktop, desktop, desktop. But what's happened in the last two or three years is now more people actually go out and, and reference the internet using tablets and smartphones. And many, you know, many people will tell you that desktops are dead. I mean, I'm using a laptop here, but I could if I needed to, try to basically do almost everything I'm doing here through either a tablet or, or my phone, all right? So what the client is in this picture is everything there that you see, desktop, tablet, and smartphone. The web server is the other end of it. So in other words, if I'm on my desk, on a desktop or a laptop or a tablet or a smartphone, and I type in there, I, I go in and key in rankin.edu, that's me. Then it goes out into the internet, and there is a web server on Rankin's side that's going to go and return the main page of Rankin to me. All right. So that's you know typically what we'll be working with. This is the whole internet, and you can go out to Google uh, Images and type in internet, and they try to actually show it where you've got this kind of thing where it's created, connected all over the world. All right. So again, you can see, as I've said to you, that down at the bottom here, what they're showing is a um, kind of a summary of what's above this and what's on the previous page. All right. All right. Next, we're going to talk about static web pages and dynamic web pages. Virtually, everything that we do for the first 30 days of this class will be static. All right, meaning more than anything else, they're very simplistic. OK, and there's not going to be a lot of interactivity. We'll create a website and we'll start creating a website, maybe even tomorrow already. I don't know, maybe even today. We'll see what the timing's like. All right, but it won't have a lot of interactivity in it. When we get into where we're, we're talking about um, JavaScript, again, around day 30, somewhere around there, day 30 to 40, somewhere in there, then we'll bring in the interactivity because that's what JavaScript does. For instance, if you've ever gone out to a website and at the bottom of the page on the website, maybe it's got the date and the time, or maybe on the bottom of the page, it's got what's called a hits counter that says something like, you were the 1,043rd person to visit this page. That's typically done using JavaScript. All right, we're not going to be worried about that for now. Instead, we're going to just be worried about static web pages. Now, there's a there's a couple things that are in here that you're going to have to understand. They may not totally make sense now, but this is 
what three of the four classes in this program are about, and that is HTTP. And HTTP is an acronym. As you can see, it stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. All right, and it's the way that, that basically your computer can talk with other computers, for lack of better words. What you do is if you type in, if you either type in something into your address bar and hit enter, or if you click a hyperlink, you're basically making what's called an HTTP request. All right, that's going to be basically, it's going to be sent out to a server someplace. That server will do something with it. And ideally, it will send information back to you in the form of an HTML document, and that'll be an HTTP response. The reason that this is so important is HTTP is kind of the magic that makes virtually everything work. And you send out requests, you get back responses. All right, and that's what they're talking about here. They show it pictorially well, right there. That's real simple. Now, what you're going to see in just a moment is they're going to talk about this and they're going to mention dynamic web pages. And typically with dynamic web pages, there's more than one server involved. Here, there's just one server. And, and there could technically be more than one, but it's pretty simplistic. So when you look at this, notice HTML is used to define web pages. That's what it is. It is a markup language that you use to say what the web page should look like. CSS, which we'll get to in cascading style sheets, that allows you to, for lack of better words, add aesthetics to your page. So if I wanted this page right here, if this was my web page, and I wanted it to have a blue background, or maybe I wanted it to be reversed from what it is. Maybe I wanted a black background with white text. I could do that through CSS. And then finally, JavaScript, provides the interactivity. So again, things like a hit counter or maybe the date and time and other things. So that's what we're going to be working on in here. Again, I don't want to sit and read this to you, but you should understand that what an HTTP request is going into the system, what an HTTP, re HTTP response is coming back from the system. All right. When you bring in a dynamic web page, I like to think of something like Amazon. All right. So if I go out to Amazon and, and I'm not going to do this, I could, but I don't think we have to. But if I go out to Amazon and uh, when I'm out there, it asks me what I'm looking for. Let's say that I'm looking for a book on HTML. So I go and I choose books in their drop down list of things I can go through. And then I type in the search bar. I type in HTML. All right. The same kind of thing is going to happen that you saw before. There still is going to be an HTTP request. It'll still end with an HTTP response, but virtually always there's going to be more than one server involved. And even on this one, even on this page that was right here, even this page, there's typically, you know, unless it's a really small site, for example, Rankin, to my knowledge, has more than one web server. And why do they have more than web server, more than one? But what if that one they had went down? All right, they'd have to have another one would be, be able to pick up the slack type of thing. But again, when you are working here with dynamic web pages, not only are there different, uh, a number of different servers, but they can have different judges. That you see on your, its job, might be that that if I go out to Amazon and I say HTML and maybe I find this Muroc book and I go and click on it, that database server will have to tell me if that book is available, how many copies are available. So if I want a copy, you know, I can get it. And if they're out, then it gives me that message. So as it says there, it receives it. It looks up the extension to find out which server should process the request. What does that mean? When we create HTML pages, which we're going to start doing either the end of, period of the period today or the beginning of the period or sometime tomorrow, HTML pages 
used to end with an extension of .htm. And that was back in the days when your file extension at the end, what comes after the period could only be three characters. And now it can be as many characters as you need it to be. So it's their .html files. All right. So it says based on what, you know, what it, what the server, initial server received, it knows which, which other server to push the request out to. And you'll notice there's, arrows going this way and arrows coming back, just like there was an arrow going in here and there's an arrow coming back here. So this is the client side, this is the server side. And again, this is what we're going to be basically concentrating on in this class. You concentrate a lot more on this in the, cl the classes in your last two, um, last two classes that you have. So again, how does JavaScript fit into this? As I mentioned, it allows you to bring some dynamicity into this. They give an example here, and maybe you've seen this kind of thing before. All right, where you'll notice that right here, they've got this as land's end, and right now they've chosen green for the color, so this lady's blouse or whatever it is, is green. If they had chosen a brown, it would be brown. So you can go and change all these. So when you go and you roll over, one of these, basically it does a swap right here. You're going to learn how to do that. And believe it or not, it's really not that difficult to do. All right, in fact, I should show you this. I don't wanna get off on a tangent here, but I did wanna show you something that I thought of during the break. So let me look here. One of the first websites that we're going to create together is going to be for a mythical gym. And as soon as it comes up, as soon as it finds it, I'll show you what it'll look like. I think I think this will work. There's a bunch of them here. All right, so we'll have this. Now, it may not look like much. This is all garbage text, but watch how this is going to change. There we go. So we'll have stuff fade in and fade out, and we'll be able to go to a different page. And this may or may not look like much, but notice when I click how that changes. All right. And then we can go and we'll have this. These are This is a FAQ or a frequently asked questions page. This will allow us to bring in something like jQuery where we can do this. We can have as many of these open as we want to or need to have open. All right. And you can even see in here when you look, there's CSS in here. What do I mean? Notice the background color. It's kind of an almond color. That was CSS to do that. Then when we get into the JavaScript, we'll be able to add our own stuff in here. So if I say that I'm 72 inches tall and in my dreams, I weigh 180 pounds, it says that I'm of optimal weight for my height. But if I'm 110 pounds, it says that I'm underweight. And if I'm, that again, if I'm 200 pounds, it'll say that I'm overweight. And if I'm, let's say 333 pounds, I'm obese. So that's the kind of thing that we're going to be doing. And then after that, we'll also learn how to create forms, something like this. And you'll notice that if I don't add things and if I hit submit, I start getting error messages. But as soon as I put in something here, so if I put in Jeff, you notice how that message goes away. So if I do that, and I put in all this, I'm just going to fill them all in just so you see them. I'm going to leave the state off and I'll leave these off. And now notice I just got this. So if I choose Missouri. Now that one is gone. If I come in here and I put in a zip code that makes sense like this. On, but if I put in here a dash, which doesn't make sense, now I get a different error message. So if I put in 1111, let's say it's good, but if I put in two, because there should only be four digits there, I again get an error message. All right. And then finally for a phone, it wants it in this format. So if I put in here, 314-286-3675, it still won't like it. It'll still give me an error. All right. Well, it says all checks pass, but really what it should have done is it should have wanted it in this format here. Like that. 
Okay, and I can go back and forth. These are called radio buttons. You'll learn how to create those. And these are check boxes, so you can have them both unchecked, either one checked or both checked. All right, so that's the one of the first sites that we're going to create. Now we're going to create it over weeks because we'll talk about the beginning stuff and then we'll add the other stuff to it. But this is very much is going to be a static website. All right. OK. So they're saying why you why would you use JavaScript here? And you can see I'm not going to read to you. But you already saw the validation and you saw the the rollover right there. All right. Now carousels in accordion type of things you may have seen or you actually saw an accordion. That was that that frequently asked question page. A carousel, you know, when we create something, a lot of times on the home page of a site or on one of the other pages of the site, you'll have where you get a bunch of images that keep going across the screen. That would be a slideshow or a carousel. All right. Okay, so JavaScript. This is not really a great sentence. It says because JavaScript runs on the client, not the server. Well, that's true, but it's not true. You can run JavaScript on the client or on the server or on both. And if that doesn't make sense to you, that's what the classes in the second year are about. All right, so we come in here and here is an introduction to HTML and CSS. Again, HTML acronym for hypertext markup language. All right, and is an organization that for lack of better words is in charge of html all right they are called the w3c the letter w the number three the letter c and the three in there stands for world wide web they are the world wide web consortium and what happens is they come out with recommendations and they say you ought to be doing this you ought to be doing this now the different browser companies so google for google chrome microsoft for edge uh, mozilla i think owns firefox etc all right they can choose to adhere to those recommendations or not by and large they do adhere to them they do whatever it is you know that they're told to do now they don't come up with these recommendations very often all right but they do and I want to show you one more thing before we go on in here, because we've actually done quite a bit of this chapter already. Because what I've been doing today is I've given you a bunch of URLs, and then I gave you these the steps to go out there, but there's two more URLs that I want to give you. All right. And the first one is simple. It'll be w, w3schools.com, and the other one will be developer.mozilla. Dot org. And again, you don't have to worry about writing these down. You're going to get this piece of paper in one form or another at the end of the class today. But let me quickly show you these two sites. Because a lot of times what will happen is people will say to me, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to learn and I'm having some problems with this or I'm having some problems with that. Can you can you give me some recommendations of sites I can go out to? Well, W3Schools.com, the one I just showed you. If you go out there, not much to look at. It's kind of ugly, to be honest with you. But if you go over here to tutorials, there's their HTML tutorial. There's their JavaScript tutorial. There's their jQuery tutorial. Um, there's their CSS tutorial. There's their Bootstrap tutorial. So if I just choose HTML, for example, okay, this is it over here. So there's basically a page for each thing in here. Do you have to go through this? Uh, you don't have to do anything. But sometimes when people want to learn, this is a good way to learn. They show you something and then there's a try it yourself. And when you click on that, notice it says here, this is a heading, this is a paragraph. So if I change this, for example, to Jeff Scott, and I change this down here to Rankin Technical College. And then I click the run button. You can see how it changed. All right, so this is a really nice way. Just w3schools.com 
you know, if you're confused on something. And a lot of times, if you go and you do a uh, a Google search for something in HTML, you're going to find the W3 schools is, is going to be one, of, if not the first thing that comes back, one of the first. The other one that I mentioned to you is developer.mozilla.org. Again, not what I'd call a beautiful site, all right? But if you look in there, they've got references. There's their HTML reference, their CSS, their JavaScript, et cetera. I actually went through these, and I'll, if I remember, I'll try to throw them out on the site. But I made probably a couple hundred videos during one summer where I went through all this stuff, each page, each one of these things in here, and did presentations on them. All right. I've got right now, and I'm not that I'm proud or not proud of this, but on my YouTube channel, about 300 followers. And I know that's not many when some people have thousands or millions, but um, a lot of people have told me that they've looked at the stuff that I've done and they've, they've really gotten a lot of help from it. All right, and that's why I do it. All right. So HTML is a markup language. You're gonna create stuff that's going to look like this. OK, and we're going to get into this tomorrow. Take my word for it. I'm going to explain what each one of these lines of code mean. We're going to type in about a dozen lines of code ourselves, and then we're going to pick and choose stuff from all over the place. We're going to make a really, really, one more time, really simple website tomorrow. It'll have three pages on it. All right. And it's just like I said, it's just going to be simple. All right. Just to get people into the flow, so to speak. But there is an example of HTML. There is an example of HTML. There is an example of HTML. Not every, but almost every time you put in something with HTML, it has what's called an opening tag and a closing tag. Sometimes they're called beginning and end tags. It doesn't matter. And you'll notice, for example, here, this tag and this tag look the same, except the ending tag has a forward slash before it. Same thing with body and body. Same thing with H1 and H1, or Im the image doesn't have one. Paragraph and ending paragraph. We're going to go through all of this stuff starting tomorrow. All right. But HTML is set up to define, as it says there, the structure of the page, but mostly the content of your web page. Right. OK, the CSS again is designed. To make your web page pretty. So the first file that we looked at was a file that ends with dot CS. I'm sorry, dot HTML. This file ends in dot CSS. Well, we're, we're even going to do this tomorrow. We'll add a little bit of CSS, even though it won't make much sense to you. We'll keep it simple. All right, just to show you how you can change things. This says that for our entire document, we want to use an Arial font. If Arial isn't available, we want you to use Helvetica. If Helvetica isn't available, I want you to use sans serif. Every computer has a sans serif font. All right. We want the font size to be 100% or as big as it can be. I'm not going to go through all these. All right. But there's a bunch of different things in there. So what that did was it took that page that looked like this, all right, looks fine the way it is, but it prettied it up a little bit. You'll notice that the, the heading up here is blue, that the border they put around here is also blue, etc. just so you can start seeing some of that stuff. And notice it says on there too, cascading style sheets or CSS is used basically to control how pages are displayed. So it's the aesthetics of a page. All right. I don't, I'm not a big, actually, I love history. History on this. Let me just tell you that in the, in the 1990s, HTML was it. That's how you did everything with every web page. All right. That's just how people did it. Then somewhere around, somewhere around, uh, I don't know. In fact, it was earlier than that. Maybe it was the 70s. I don't know. But somewhere around the mid 90s, people said, you know what? HTML, it ain't hacking it anymore. We want something new. 
So they went out and they created a new thing, which you may or may not have heard of, that was that's called XML. And XML is another acronym. It stands for Extensible Markup Language. The idea was XML was supposed to replace HTML. And the big difference is HTML has about 100 tags that you have to use in a certain way. With XML, you make up your own tags. It never really caught on like people thought it would. And then back in the late 90s, people said, you know, maybe HTML isn't that bad. And that's when HTML5 came to be and much more popular. All right. This XHTML was when they were attempting to transition over from XML, I'm sorry, from HTML to XML. All right. So again, you can see kind of the timeline in here. And here's the same timeline, but for CSS. CSS 3.0 is the latest, and you'll notice when you look at it, it's almost 25 years old. All right. I already mentioned this W3C to you, the World Wide Web Consortium. That's its website. I will tell you not to be funny. I don't think this is funny, but if you want some very bland reading, go out there and take a look at it. There's also WattWG, which as it says there, is the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group. And they also help the W3C as far as maintaining different kinds of standards. All right, the tools. The text editor that I had you use was Visual Studio Code. As they say, it's free. You saw this already. Now, what you use in the next class, for those of you who have not yet taken the C Sharp class, you don't use Visual Studio Code, you use Visual Studio. Visual Studio Code is an editor. Visual Studio is what's called an IDE. It's an integrated development environment. What's the difference? An IDE basically will do some of the work for you. In other words, there's a lot of look ahead and there, there's a lot of features that it uses where it thinks you want to type in this. And if that's what you want, you just hit the tab key. You don't have that stuff as much with Visual Studio, all right, which Visual Studio Code. So this is VS Code. This is what we're going to be working with in just a couple minutes or tomorrow, depending on what time we finish up here, all right? Again, there's Notepad++, there's TextMate, there's CodePen, there's Atom. Uh, there, there, there. I'm sure there are a good dozen to, to three dozen different editors you could use. All right. The advantage of VS Code and things like Atom and Notepad is they're free. All right. Adobe Dreamweaver and an AWS Cloud, typically, they're not free. They do more for you, but you have to pay for them. So as it says, the text editor lets you enter and edit HTML, CSS, and eventually JavaScript. Some of this will be color coded, and you'll see that tomorrow. And IDE, as they mentioned, goes beyond that. All right, and it allows you to do some things you can't do otherwise. Now, not today, but eventually I'll show you FileZilla. All right, what we used to have at Rankin is we had a server that was dedicated just to the students. So the students could put their stuff out there on it. And then anybody else in the world, if you gave them the, the URL, they could look at it. Well, we're not using it much anymore. And the reason we're not using it is twofold. Number one, it was getting hacked a lot for whatever reason. And number two, it tended to go down a lot. All right, so we've got some alternatives to that that we will be going over later on in the semester. This is what FileZilla looks like. Don't worry about it. All right. Now, how to view how to view a web page and its source code. You may or may not be aware of something here. I'm going to go out. I could use this page. It doesn't matter. But I'm going to go out to CNN.com. All right. And there's the page. Now, if I wanted to see the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that make up this page, I can right mouse click. Typically, I do it in an empty area of the page and I choose view page source. And there is that's all of the 
right there, that is all of the CSS and HTML that make up the page. You know what? Well, that's not very big. Well, a lot of these are references to other files right here. All right. And some of these you can look at, some of these you cannot look at. So I'm going to try to look at this homepage.json and it does let me look at it. Okay. Some of the other pages, I mean, some of the stuff it probably is in there, I would guess is proprietary. All right, meaning that it's not meant to be shown, shown or shared with the public, but that's how you can view a web page. So right click. Um, yes, right. You right click right and you just choose view page source. Now, if you're not using Chrome, it might say view page or something else. And it's got to be on an HTML page. I mean, if I do it on this page, you'll notice there's nothing here. So you've got to bring up an HTML page. You'll be able to do it with yours too. All right. I mean, not that I typically do this. It'd be kind of silly, but the one page that I created for you before that garbage thing, if I if I bring this up, so let me open it. All right. If I right mouse click, remember all it said was this is just a test. But if I right mouse click on it and I choose view page source, there it is. Now, this isn't. Even though I saved it as an HTML file, what you'll notice tomorrow is we're going to doctor it up somewhat. And what I mean by that is, bring that back up here. No, not there. Try it again. That when we bring it up, and tomorrow I'll bring it up in Visual Studio Code, but um, we're going to be doing something like this. And then we'll put some stuff in here. I don't know what, but we'll put some stuff in there. And then we will end our heading, header, heading area or head area. Oops. And then this, instead of saying that, we'll, we'll put it in there as a paragraph tag. All right, then we'll end our body. Oops. And we'll end our HTML. All right, now. If I did this and brought it up, in other words, if I grabbed this file and double clicked on it, it looks the same as it did before. But now if I right mouse click on it and choose view page source, you can see the HTML that's in there. Now it is truly an HTML page. This is what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And tomorrow, whatever we end up doing and creating for a web page, I will make sure that I push that out to a GitHub repository. So if you you know you fall behind or whatever, you'll still be able to get a copy of it. All right. It won't be it really and truly won't be a big thing for anybody. All right. So they talk about what makes up a URL here. Okay. So HTTP colon slash slash, that's the protocol. That's the hypertext transfer protocol that we talked about before. Today, more than ever, instead of seeing HTTP here, you're seeing HTTPS, which means that it's secure. Anytime you've got a URL like this that could conceivably be holding class, not classified, but personal information, passwords, logins, credit card numbers, it'll be an HTTPS. In fact, if you ever go out to a site and they ask you for information, you should always click first to make sure it's an HTTPS site. All right, otherwise I recommend never giving them any information. Then the reason for that is what's going to happen is this HTTP that's like this, it's going to show information up in the address bar. The HTTPS will not show information up in the address bar. And if people know what they're doing with the HTTP, they can grab any information that's in that address bar. You wouldn't want them to be able to grab your information. So that's the protocol. The only other one that you see sometimes is FTP there, which stands for File Transfer Protocol. Then this is the domain name. So for Muroc, the authors of our book, their domain is www.muroc.com. This is the path. All right. And then this is the file name right here. Now, if I just go and do this, 
if I just go out here and I type in as an example, I could type in just Muroc, spell it right, Muroc.com and hit enter. And that brings up what's called the index.html page for Muroc. Now I could come in here and still, let's see if we do this. Notice just typing in Muroc.com, it defaulted to HTTPS colon slash slash www.muroc.com. So that's the same thing. So if I grab this and I'm going to close that and I put that whole thing in there, I get the same exact page that we just saw. All right. And that's kind of what they're showing you right here. All right, out of view of the source code, I guess I jumped ahead with the view source code, but there it is. Okay. And finally, the chapter ends by talking about these four critical web development issues. The first one, this is going to be unbelievably important to us. Responsive web design. And the reason that that is important is it says that your website that you create should look nice regardless of the type of media or medium that you're using to look at it. So in other words, it should look nice whether it's being looked at on a desktop, a laptop, a tablet, a phone, or even something else. All right. So when we get into chapter seven to 10, we're going to be talking a lot about responsive website design also known as RWD, and they're showing it here. So this might be how it looks on a laptop or a desktop, and that's how it looks on a phone. All right. All right. So as it says, the website should screen size of the device that's, that's accessing it. That's a great definition because that's exactly what it is. All right. Now, back in the olden days, I don't know when that was. It was either the 80s. I think it was the 80s, but I'm not even positive. All right. There were basically, there were two browsers. Okay. There was Internet Explorer. And there was Mozilla. That was about it. That's really about all you had. And during that time, there was something that was referred to as browser wars. All right. And what happened was, Microsoft would occasionally come up with something and they put it in their browser and Mozilla either would or would not, but they went back and forth. Now Mozilla today, I believe Mozilla owns Firefox. I could be wrong on that. I don't really care, but Microsoft basically won that war. All right. And Microsoft reigned supreme for a long, long time. Okay. Now they're not even, I, I think they're still supporting IE 11. And that's about it. And they've got Edge. OK, but there have been other manufacturers who've come up, the, the most notable being Google with Google Chrome. But browser compatibility says that your site should look nice regardless of the browser that is looking at it. All right. And they've done these things here. These are tests. OK. Notice a perfect score is 555, so they did a test on something, and here's the way they came up. Well, you know, as long as you buy a Windows machine, as long as I've been buying them, they've always had IE or Edge on them, so some people are always going to use that. They don't want to even take the, go to the trouble of downloading another one. All right, if you've got an Apple machine, you typically have Safari on there. Okay, same kind of thing. But there are sites you can go out to, not just HTML5 test, but there are sites that you can go out to. We may see this later in the book. I don't know if they have it in here still or not. That will tell you um, the percentage of, of browser use and you know who's how many, what percentage using Chrome, what percentage using Edge, et cetera. It's not that big a thing, right? This is web accessibility, and I will tell you, it says there, it refers to qualities that make a website accessible to as many users as possible, especially disabled users. First of all, a lot of people find that word disabled to, to be very, uh, just the wrong word, all right? They consider that to be insulting, but 
you can call it whatever you want, special users, users that, that need something extra, whatever. But the more public your company is, the more web accessible you are expected to make it. All right, for instance, if it was something like, let's just say the Internal Revenue Service by the IRS, they should have something out on their website that whether a person is has no physical or, or other kind of, of uh, ailments, or if they're blind, they should still be able to use it, or if they're deaf, they should still be able to use it. And there's other things that, that can happen too. All right. As it says, for instance, visually impaired users may not be able to read text, so you need to provide alternatives, that kind of thing. All right. And there's a lot of reasons you do it. Number one, it's the right thing to do. Number two, it may be required. All right. Number three, as it says, it might make your your um, site more accessible to search engines. And if I asked you what a search engine is, you you know what they are, whether you think so or not. Google, Bing, Yahoo are the big three for search engines. All right. Now, when you start talking about websites, notice here this Web AIM website. AIM is accessibility in mind. So you could go out to that and you could probably find that they, you know, they have if somebody is blind or if someone is deaf or whatever, they have different things they've come up with to make it easier for them. All right. The other thing that goes along with this that you hear a lot is the ADA, and that's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And again, as I mentioned to you, that's why a lot of times this is going to be required that you do this. And as the author says, as we go through the book here, we'll be given a set of guidelines for coding the elements and the attributes that provide web accessibility. All right, I mentioned to you quickly what search engines were. Supposedly, you know, the way that, you know, search engine optimization, you know, if I go out and do this, and you've seen this kind of thing, you probably have done this before. But if I go out here, let's just go out to Google. All right, and I'm gonna type in here, sporting goods. If I spell it right, there we go. Sporting goods, stores near me. You notice what comes up first, all right? Well, if I'm gonna start and bring up a new sporting goods store, okay, and let's get rid of the near me. Let's just put up sporting goods stores. Okay, we've got, I guess it looks pretty much the same. But if I'm in here and I'm gonna make Jeff's, I'm gonna compete with Dick's, I want a way to make my page come up first, all right? And there's different things that you can add to a website to optimize it. So when the search engine like a Google or a Bing or a Yahoo looks at it, they might move your yours up in the ranking order. All right. Nobody knows exactly what the, this formula is that they use and they try to keep it a secret. All right. But let's just say I'm Academy Sports here and I, I want to be number one. There are things I can try to add to bump me up. No guarantee that it'll happen but that I can at least try to put in there. All right, and that's basically, that's search engine optimization, okay? <clears throat> Again, the most popular, Google and Bing. Notice the goal is optimizing your website so its pages will rank high when the search engines act, um, access them. We're gonna go through a lot of this stuff in more depth, in breadth of coverage as we go on. Now, that was it for chapter one. And you may think, looking at it, well, you didn't really cover all that much. I, you know, to me, I, I'm supposed to kind of supplement or augment what's in the book. There's no way of covering everything that's in this book. Some people have told me that it makes more sense to them. They read the summary first, and then they go back and read the chapter. I've had people tell me, I got through your class and I got an A, and I didn't even read the chapter. That doesn't make me proud. All right, I would strongly suggest that at a minimum, you go through the chapter and at least look at the even number right-hand side, look at the pictures that are in there, look at the little bit of code or whatever snippets are in there or tables, and look at the summaries that they have on those pages. So we've gone through chapter one today, plus the other stuff that we've already gone over a couple times. All right, and tomorrow, when I start tomorrow, 
again, these things, these exercises, you've got those now. These are the exercises and the solutions are in what I've provided for you, all right? But tomorrow we'll pick it up. We'll actually code at least a page. We'll test it. Even if we get it to work, we'll make sure we put some errors in it so we it comes up with some problems and then we'll validate it. And we'll also add some very simple CSS because there's three ways to add CSS. I'd like to show you all three and explain why one is better than the other two. And then we will validate not only our web page, but we'll validate our CSS page. So we'll do that when we start tomorrow. And you'll notice that's what it, about 30 pages, a little shorter than today's. All right. So let me go out here. And then, whoops. Did that. Oh. All right. And then we'll jump back or go into, I should say, um, chapter three. How to use and structure an HTML page. And you can see the different things that are in there. And while we're doing this, we're going to jump back and forth between here and actually creating a simple website. All right. So unless anybody has any questions either on chapter one or anything else I've gone over today, that's it. I am letting you go early today. You know, sometimes we'll be done and we'll go the whole time till 1155. Sometimes we'll be done at 1130. It'll just depend. If I have only 10 or 15 minutes left, I don't typically like to go into something brand new then. All right. So again, if you don't have any other quest, any questions, or I'll take questions now. Let's, uh, uh, what, uh, you said that you post your, um, is there uh, somewhere in inside ranking or, or teams that uh, we can uh, review our reporting that has been going yes. on? on yes, on our and let, let, that's a great question. Let me show you two things quick. The first is, if you go out to YouTube, okay. right, and you go into YouTube and you in there, you just put me, so Jeff Scott, hyphen Rankin Technical College, you'll see a big red J, that's me. And if you click on that, this will show you all the stuff that I've got in there. All right. Literally, I have about 3,000 videos. But one of the ones that will be in there, so if I go to playlist, all right, then you'll notice spring 2023, AWD 1000 Web Development Technologies. And right now, there are, sorry about that, don't hear that guy, but there are, about 60 videos in there. This is where all mine will be placed. So the one I do for today will be here, number one. I will give you both this address in the email I'm going to send you later today. So I will give you the address to this particular playlist, plus I will give you the URL to today's video. You can also see them by going out into Teams but that, that was very problematic last semester. So everything I'm doing, I'm going to put out on my YouTube channel. All right. So you will, yes, you will get both those. You'll get a link to my YouTube channel for this class, and you'll get a link to the presentation. You'll have both of those today. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, no, no problem. Anybody else? Any other questions? All right, then I will... Have a good rest of the day. I will see you at 8.05 tomorrow. And again, you will be sent an email tomorrow morning that'll have a link on it that'll get you in like I sent for today. All right. See you tomorrow. Have a good day. You as well. Thank you. Thanks, you too. Thank, Thank you. you. You too.